Well, hello, everyone. It's uh, wonderful to be with all of you. Happy to see a uh, uh, few familiar faces and a few familiar names. Why don't we just uh, so grateful to Father Gary for inviting me to participate in this virtual retreat. What a blessing. Let's uh, just turn our hearts to the Lord for a few moments. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, you so desire for us to be one with you that you gave everything in your Son and together with him sent your Holy Spirit to fill us, speak to us, transform us, move us, draw us back to you and to one with you. Deepen our lives of prayer in this time that we have together. Teach us, enlighten us, purify us. And we ask all this through the intercession of Our Lady. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. St. Joseph, pray for us. St. Benedict, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, I hope you've had a chance to uh, do a little bit of praying, as I encourage you to do in the earlier conferences. It's always a danger to do a lot of talking about praying and never actually do any praying. So I do, I hope, do hope you uh, took a little bit of time for that uh, in, in a dedicated way. I should say, as we've described to, to a certain degree in contemplative prayer and contemplation, there's a way in which we really do become prayer, that our relationship with God so permeates everything we do that, uh, that, that all of it is an act of love, that we really are united with him. That's the kind of culmination of the spiritual life and the, the unitive way or uh, deification or theosis as they call it in the Byzantine Eastern Christian church. But really that our, everything we do would become permeated with prayer is certainly the goal, but that, that develops from taking dedicated times for prayer. And so I hope uh, a day of recollection in itself should be that kind of dedicated time for prayer, but then also some punctuated moments. And I know it's a little harder when you're at home and it's a little easier when you're actually physically in a retreat center, but it's not impossible at home. And it's a wonderful practice to develop, again, insofar as we are able to. I want to share a little bit with you now about uh, Lexia Divina. I have some slides again I understand some of the text is a little bit small. I apologize for that. It's never clear how these things come across exactly, but I'm happy to share the slides. I'll just share them as one deck of slides with all of the uh, uh, bits, all, all three parts included. But I wanna focus in our time this afternoon on Lexio Divina. And let me see if I can do this effectively. Of course not. And just say a, a few words about this beautiful practice. It's, it's just a great way to bring together, especially in a home retreat, it's a great way to bring together the kinds of things that we talked about in the first two conferences in personal prayer. Uh, we're able to bring our humanity to the Lord as we encounter him in his holy word. And uh, we're also able to enter into a more contemplative place. It really is the, the goal we could say of Lexio Divina is to, to prepare our, our hearts for a more contemplative union with God. And it can really open up vulnerability as we engage God in his word. His, his word, which is uh, in its fullness, his divine son. As St. John teaches us in the prologue of his gospel, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And so the Word, God's self-expression, we could say, that, that God, that ha there's, a, there's a logos, there's a divine wisdom, there's, a, there's an internal principle, uh, uh, 
which is ultimately love, that, that that's so much uh, part of God, it really is God, you know? So it's the, the second person of the Blessed Trinity. But that word became flesh in Jesus Christ. And so he gives his whole word to us in Jesus. And then if we had to turn Jesus into to words, <laughs> then we, we do that through the scripture especially, and uh, also as it's interpreted authentically through the, uh, the teaching authority of the church, the magisterium. And so we, we really have this beautiful gift of God's self-revelation and his divine word. And then that's brought into, again, prayer is human. Christian prayer is human. And part of our humanity is, you know, I only, I only speak English really well. Even that's arguable, to, according to some. Uh, you know, I speak a, a bit of German. I can do reasonably well in German. I can do a play a little bit with Latin, Greek, something like that. But, you know, I'm really limited by language. And, and all of us have some limitations by language. But God allows himself to be limited. He allows himself to be expressed in this limited way, turned into human languages. It's amazing, really amazing that he allows himself to do that. I dare say you and I might hesitate to do that. Maybe if somebody wanted to write a biography of you, you might hesitate a little bit. I mean, can they really express you in human words? And of course they can't express your whole life in human words. It would take your whole life to express your whole life. And that's true of God in an infinite degree. But by the power of the Holy Spirit, those words of sacred scripture are not just a biography of God. They are actually his living word to us. He allows himself to encounter us in the scripture. He allows himself to meet us in the scripture. And that's why we have more in sacred scripture than merely human words trying to make some effort at expressing God. We really have God himself being given. And so in the context of the liturgy, especially, the Second Vatican Council says that it is Jesus Christ who speaks when his word is proclaimed. And that's certainly been the church's faith from the beginning, is that we're really getting not just human words, but we're getting more than that. Also with the grace of God, with the power of God coming to us. And so when we take time to pray with sacred scripture, there's something beautiful happening. It's not just spiritual reading. It's not just reading good theology. It really is receiving and encountering the living God. So that's a little entree for praying with scripture through Lexio Divina. Now, if you were at a retreat center, I would be very quick to tell you, spend time in front of the Blessed Sacrament because that's really God. God has allowed himself to be limited to the point of being present under the appearance of bread. What an incredible limitation. And yet, it really is God. We worship him as God in the Eucharist. And so spending time with him in the Eucharist is something so beautiful and something so valuable. But insofar as we're not able to be with the Eucharist, or in addition to being with the Eucharist, if you are or would be able to do that, we still benefit from hearing God speak. You can, you can think of that uh, like being with a human being. It's wonderful to be with a human being in silence, it's wonderful to be with a human being and speak to each other. And that's the chance that we have. Lexio really gives us the chance to hear God's word spoken to us and to re reply with our own word and then to come to rest in a place of encounter in mutual love. Pope Benedict really believed in Lexio Divina. And we'll see if I can actually manage to use my slides here. So, and I'm sure this is one of those, uh, we'll see if I can zoom in on that, make it a little easier for you to read there. Oops. Pope Benedict went so far as to say, I would like in particular to recall and recommend the ancient tradition of Lexio Divina, the diligent reading of sacred scripture accompanied by prayer brings about that intimate dialogue in which the person reading hears God who is speaking and in praying responds to him with trusting openness of heart. It's a wonderful summary description of Lexio Divina. God is speaking. When we read his word prayerfully, we can hear him. 
we are summoned not just to be recipients, but even respondents. He wants our response. And so when we pray in response, we speak to him. Then Pope Benedict says, here's the bold statement. If it is effectively promoted, this practice of Lexio Divina will bring to the church, I am convinced of it, a new spiritual springtime. Wouldn't you like to see that? Don't we need that more than ever? New spiritual springtime. As a strong point of biblical ministry, Lexio Divina should therefore be increasingly encouraged. So I take my marching orders from Pope Benedict XVI, and by the way, from Pope John Paul II, and by the way, from Pope Francis, all of whom have vigorously promoted Lexio Divina as a, as a form of prayer that really engages initial believers and that engages the greatest saints, the, the, those sort of most highly united with God in mystical prayer. Everybody is engaged by Lexio Divina, whatever level of relationship you are in with, with God. So it's really a beautiful way of praying. You can see my little spiritual springtime. Now, uh, as a side note, you might or might not recognize that as the church in Orvieto that is basically a big uh, monstrance for the Eucharistic miracle that took place there in the 13th, 12th or 13th century uh, that, that a host actually turned to flesh and bled. But tying it together, always tying it together, the word and sacrament, Lexio Divina, Eucharistic adoration, they just fit so nicely together. Of course, they can also be done separately and then, you know, uh, flow together in time. I know people can't necessarily get to church in these days, but you can still do Lexio Divina, which is wonderful. So let's take a look at those different steps of Lexio Divina and Pope Benedict gives us a, a wonderful account of Lexio Divina, teaching on Lexio Divina in uh, his apostolic exhortation, Verbum Domini, on the Word of God. And I'm going to walk through that as well as uh, my Benedictine formation. You know, uh, every religious order has to brag about its own stuff. Uh, part of the Benedictine stuff is the fact that Lexio Divina has always been part of our charism. It's just, it's caught on in the universal church now in these days. So always happy to share a little bit of Lexio Divina. Now to be ecumenical, I have a picture of St. Ignatius of Loyola there. Uh, you can see uh, his little scripture open to the greater glory of God, ad maiorem de gloriam. But the first step of Lexio Divina is, is to start with the Bible. We, uh, Open, open the scriptures, open the Bible. And that's certainly a, a fruit of our time. You know, there are certain things that have been just kind of blessings for us since the Second Vatican Council. And I think a, a greater appreciation for the riches of sacred scripture has really been one of the gifts of the Second Vatican Council. I think an increase in Eucharistic adoration, by the way, has also been one of the great gifts of the Second Vatican Council. And my estimation would be that the third one is spiritual direction. I think the renewal of spiritual direction has been another great gift since the Vatican Council. But to uh, return to our subject here, I just became nervous that you weren't seeing the image, but it looks like you are. So what does the text say in itself? Well, first of all, where do we open to in the scripture? Uh, I always encourage the Gospels as a primary starting point. We're just, especially as Catholics, I think that we really have a good familiarity with the Gospels. So all scripture has a, has a little bit of an otherworldly quality to it. You know, it has a little bit of its own unique vocabulary, its own unique way of capturing events, of expressing things. And we have to kind of get our mind into that approach to begin with. Uh, I think the Gospels tend to be most accessible, followed soon after by the other letters of the New Testament, uh, by the Acts of the Apostles and then the letters of the New Testament. Uh, but somewhere in the New Testament, I would encourage as a starting point, uh, just make it easier on yourself. You know, it's hard enough to relate with God. He's, uh, 
he's a divine being, we're a human being, and it's always a little bit of work to make that, to bridge that gap. So, so make it as easy as possible for yourself. But obviously, if you do feel more comfortable, you really have a context for the Old Testament, you understand how to read that genre of scripture, or actually there are several in the Old Testament, historical books, prophetic books, uh, the books of the law. Uh, you know, so open the scriptures, take a small passage. So Lexio Divina is not about consuming a lot of material. It's really about coming into encounter with God, meeting him. Oh, it's very interesting. Somebody drew on my picture here. Um, so we're, we're really uh, trying to meet God in our, in our prayer with scripture. So open the text and with that kind of expectation, with an open heart that you would have an encounter with God. And then we start with what the text says in itself, actually read it. And that's the, the right starting point. So Maybe let me uh, just demonstrate with a little text from scripture here. We could look at, uh, at tomorrow's gospel passage. It's always a, a wonderful way to prepare for the Sunday readings to have, do a little bit of Lexio. So Matthew chapter 10, verses 37 to 42. Um, I'll just read the whole passage. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. He who receives you receives me. And he who receives me receives him who sent me. He who receives a prophet because he is a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he who receives a righteous man because he is a righteous man will receive a righteous man's reward. And whoever gives to one of these little ones even a cold, cup of cold water because he is a disciple, truly I say to you, he shall not lose his reward. So, Read the text. That's the starting point. And then I would read it through once and then read it through a second time. And on the second and third time, start asking a simple question. How do I see God's love for me in this passage? And that really becomes the starting point for our meditation. How do I see God's love for me in this passage? And meditation, meditatio, is going to be a way of really chewing on the text. And I'm asking the question, what is it saying? I asked, what does it say in itself? You know, I want to start with the text itself. And then I'm asking, what is it saying to me? And I'm, I'm thinking about that, especially in terms of God's particular love for me. It's a good way to uh, begin that interpretation. It's always a, it's always a, a, a correct interpretation. God is always loving me in whatever word I'm reading in the sacred scripture. That's just a fact. So it's a, it's a nice starting point. And so I'm reading through that and um, we could pick some of the harder words in that. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Uh, you know, part of that is really teaching us that he wants to have this exclusive relationship with us. That's, that's, that's higher than every other relationship. He's not, um, I remember someone said to me, there's never a problem with loving someone too much. It's only a matter of then not loving, that we should learn to love God more. We always wanna love God more. We don't wanna love people less or, or even things less really. We always wanna love God more. And so it's a, it's a matter of putting him higher. And he's saying that he is worthy of all of our love because he actually loves us that way. He's always making us more. He's making our relationship with him uh, as, as such an exclusively unrepeatably important part of, of him. He's, he's holding us in that high regard. And so he can ask us to hold him in that high regard. 
And then there's an overflow into every other relationship. So anyway, uh, we, we could use one of those words. I just wanna use this last little word. Whoever gives to one of these little ones, even a cup of cold water, because he is a disciple, truly I say to you, he shall not lose his reward. Whoever gives to one of these little ones, even a cup of cold water. And the first thing we can do in meditation is just repeat the word, even whoever gives one of these little ones, even a cup of cold water. Whoever gives to one of these little ones, even a cup of cold water. Whoever gives to one of these little ones, even a cup of cold water. And that repetition is the first form of meditation. And that's the wonderful thing. Everybody can do that, right? We can just repeat that word. Whoever gives a cup of cold water to one of these little ones, whoever gives a cup of cold water to one of these little ones, that simple repetition so that I don't have to look at the text anymore. That's really valuable that I just have that text inside of me now. Whoever gives a cup of cold water to one of these little ones. And then I'm looking for how does how do I see God's love for me in that? Well, I'm one of these little ones. And that, that God would encourage people to give even a cup of cold water to me as one of his little ones. And that he's close to the little ones. He's identifying with the little ones. He's looking out for the little ones. We're always in danger of overlooking them. And in my own littleness and in the littleness of those around me, I know that God sees that as a higher value. The world sees that as unproductive and useless and they don't do anything valuable and wait till they grow up or put them off to the side where they won't get in the way. But God sees those little ones as the great value, worthy of his attention. Whoever gives a cup of cold water to one of these little ones. And then I feel those places in myself that feel very incapable and feel unable to, to pray or um, maybe unable to interact with others or unable to achieve and I have a struggle and I see that God loves my littleness. He loves that littleness in me and he's providing for me and protecting me. So that's a, just a little meditation that we can do there as an example. The next step is then that I I respond to God's word to me. And that's the stage of, of prayer, oratio. How do I respond to this? So in my meditation, whoever gives a cup of cold water to one of these little ones, and I feel my own littleness sometimes being overlooked or feeling awkward, not really able to socially connect with people. And I feel a little, little bit on the outside and I feel kind of isolated. And I see that Jesus provides for me, sometimes very directly. I feel him come close to me and look after me. Or somebody comes up to me at that moment. And it's like giving me a cup of cold water that they pay a little bit of attention. They're kind, generous. They, they see me, they help me. And I see that's God's special love for me. He's providing for me in this special way. And I say, thank you, Lord. Thank you for providing for me. Thank you for seeing me and not despising my littleness, for giving me permission to be a little one that you care for in a special way. Thank you, Lord, for looking after me. I praise you. I need your help. I need this from you all the time. I need your love. I know how incapable I am and how limited I feel. Please be with me. Help me. So just a little response that way to what the Lord is, is saying to us in the meditation. Now, in, the, in Lexio Divina, we're not walking through, it's not, it's not a liturgy. You know, we're not saying, okay, Lexio, check, Meditatio, check, Oratio, check, Contemplatio, check. We're, it's, it's really a movement of prayer. You know, it's like if I told you how to relate to somebody and I said, well, when you meet somebody, you know, look them in the eye, extend your hand, little handshake, give your name, talk to them. You might want to talk about this, talk about this, talk about this. You wouldn't take that as instructions as if you were baking a cake. You know, you would take that organically and you, you, oh, I see. These are some of the tools for interacting with people that I can use to develop a relationship. And that's really what Lexio is too. So in reality, we tend to 
especially these first three stages, you kind of go around a little bit. You know, I do a little bit of meditating, a little bit of responding, a little bit of listening, meditating, reading, responding. So there's a flow back and forth, but helps to see the stages. So sometimes we can take those steps intentionally as well. But especially that meditation and prayer, kind of back and forth, that's how our dialogue with the Lord develops. Whoever gives a cup of cold water to one of these little ones, you know, you can actually turn that into a personal word for you and hear Jesus say, I love to give you a cup of cold water and I, I love to provide those little moments of grace for you. And I love to bring people, move people to reach out to you and help you. You know, we can just hear him say some of those things to us. Says, Thank you, Lord. You're so good to me. I'm so grateful. How, how, did I, how did I receive such a loving Lord? Why is it that you see me and love me like this? Yeah, so we can have that kind of dialogue with him. And then ultimately, we're moving to a place that we can just rest in him. And that's basically what, what contemplation, uh, well, it's, you know, it's a, a way we can express contemplation as we did in the last conference just resting in a loving awareness of the Lord's presence. Um, you know, we can, this, this can be a kind of affective prayer that it's just enjoying being in the presence of the universal good. Uh, we can just rest and enjoy him, savor the taste of his love, of his presence. Um, we have this image of uh, St. Teresa, her heart being pierced, you know, it's a kind of ecstatic contemplation. That's a a particular variety. We might have a very dark contemplation too that we're not, a, we're not necessarily getting any particular feelings. You know, it might just be that dark faith that we know God is present and, and we remain in his presence and we, uh, he's worthy of that. So we're just kind of moved to silence. Um, you know, I'm trying to elaborate these steps and make them accessible for everyone. But as we, especially as we move along in the spiritual life, just like you would have in a marriage or any other relationship, you know, it's, it becomes more and more simple and just a matter of being with each other. Um, now, married couples, I suppose, after 30, 40, 50 years, they have a moment here or there. there there's a little electricity, you know, I mean, that's, uh, that's not out of bounds, obviously. Um, but a lot of it is just really living together, you know, being together and, and just being so familiar with each other that, you can just kind of be together. So, so there's a lot of that kind of contemplation that develops too. But, but contemplation fundamentally is just being in that presence with him. Now, Pope Benedict makes this interesting question. He adds these questions to his description of Lexio Divina. He talks about the conversion of mind and heart that is necessary to be more united with God's will. And it's a very interesting expression, but it's basically identifying the fact that we are really being made one with him. Ultimately, contemplation is a oneness with God in mind and heart, a oneness in our intellect and our will. And, and so in that oneness with God, we have uh, this, this contemplative, uh, well, it's a, it's a deeper conversion that's always necessary to make us more one with him. So, so there may be a way that he's you know, kind of melting us down through the first, first three parts of prayer. And then it's like, how do I need to be molded now? How is he going to mold me in this contemplative place so that I'm more constantly aware of his presence, more constantly in touch with him? So it's an interesting little uh, adjustment that, that he has there. How do I allow God to live in me more by, by, by allowing the obstacles to be sort of melted away, you could say. But fundamentally, to go back to it, Contemplation is, is going to be a, just a kind of resting in his presence. You know, generally words run out and we find ourselves in a bit of silence and we're just there with him. And we should have generous amounts or, or leave room for generous amounts of that kind of prayer. I think, especially in our modern world, we're tempted to be very busy and do a lot of cycling, processing and, and a lot of action. Um, so take a generous amount of time to just be with him. And, and as you're, maybe your heart is warmed through uh, meditation and, and prayer, uh, meditatio and oratio, as you, you come to a little bit of insight maybe, as you're reading the scripture and it's speaking to you personally, when you have a little bit of light or whatever it is, you know, just leave the space to just be with him, to just rest with him. 
Now, those were the four stages of Lexio Divina for a thousand years until our beloved Pope Benedict XVI decided to add a final stage of Actio. He points out that prayer is only complete when it manifests itself in charity, that, that prayer is not about just coming into my own sort of internal place. Prayer is ultimately transforming us into God, and God is always going out of himself in charity. And so it's natural that we should go out of ourselves in charity. Now, the way that Pope Benedict expresses it is really worth taking note of, though, because sometimes charity becomes a sort of activism. And actio is not meant to be a kind of activism, that it's, a, that it's not all about doing things in the uh, corporal works of mercy sense, but also the spiritual works of mercy. And that's why I wanted to picture St. Therese. Nobody thinks of her as a woman of axio so much, but in fact, she is. That's why she's the patroness of the missions. She is a woman of profound action because of her self-offering. And this is the way that Pope Benedict says it. He talks about being moved to make a gift of my life for others in charity. And St. Therese made a gift of her life for others in charity. She didn't herself go to the mission. She didn't herself go to the soup kitchen or the homeless shelter. She offered her life in prayer and sacrifice, living in community, just really seeking to make that, uh, that act of love, that pure act of love that as St. John of the Cross said, is worth more than all of the other works of the church combined. So she was just looking for that, that pure act of love, just to love Jesus as no one had loved him before. And she did that in such a beautiful way in her act of oblation to divine mercy. But that's real axio. That's real manifestation, making my life a gift for others. Now, those uh, who are in the world and who do have those capacities, obviously, homeless shelters and missionary activity and uh, different ministries in the church and, and, and taking the gospel into our workplace, into politics, into the temporal sphere, and all of that, obviously. That's obvious. But I just want to not lose the kind of more contemplative dimension, too, that is, that is so essential. And I'm at, at time here, so I'll just finish up with my, my last slide and, and maybe not even say too much about this and leave this a little bit more for the last conference. But uh, Pope Benedict points out that Mary is the supreme model of Lexio Divina. And he says, we find the supreme synthesis and fulfillment of this process in the mother of God. For every member of the faithful, Mary is the model of docile acceptance of God's word where she kept all these things, pondering them in her heart. She discovered the profound bond which unites in God's great plan, apparently disparate events, actions, and things. So she really had a heart that brought all of it together, became a kind of synthesis of all that God was doing in the world. So I'm just going to bring it to a, a conclusion there and invite uh, any any questions that people had as uh, I'll let Father mediate that process, but I think uh, Yeah, we'll just ask that anyone who wants to offer a question, turn on your video and audio and join in. Father, you can stop your screen share too and then Oh, thanks. Yep. I got a question. Uh, while other people are thinking of questions, I know they are. Um, it just occurred to me as you were describing all that, uh, and thanks, I've heard, you know, it, there were kind of new things there actually and how to describe it, but um, do, do, I always thought of Lexio as something you set out to do, but it occurred to me that an experience I'm having and praying the divine office actually turns into Lexio, where, where I'm praying this prayer for the office of readings or whatever, and something just suddenly snags me in it. I've read it, I don't know how many times before, and it never did, and it does. And then I go back to it, and then I see the Lord loved me in that, 
And I start crying, you know, and I start talking to him about it. And I thought, oh my goodness, it's sort of like Lexio happening to me without, I think. Does that make sense? Or have you ever heard of that? <laughs> yeah, I, I think uh, Pope Benedict makes the analogy between Lexio Divina and Eucharistic adoration explicitly in talking about indulgences. You know, he says, half an hour of Eucharistic adoration is a plenary indulgence and uh, half an hour of Lexio Divina is a plenary indulgence. And so he's, you know, uh, we're, we have the capacity to have an encounter with the Lord. And just like we would not say to someone, you know, oh, are you, are you, do, are you doing Eucharistic adoration or something like that? Um, I think the analogy is right there. It's Lexio Divina is very fundamentally encountering the Lord through his word. And so um, that's the, that's the main thing. Now that, you know, a thousand years later unfolded in, reflecting on certain phases that it tends to go through. And so that way we can kind of uh, generate that, that process from the bottom up and not just have it happen to us from the top down. But yeah, ultimately, Lexio is really just uh, an encounter with God through, uh, through his word. So, so we're going to have that with the divine office. It really becomes a mode of, of, uh, of relating, you know, so more, more than a, some kind of technique. Again, the value of having a description, having a special name, having some stages is it might help people to move into it in a different way than they normally would in reading scripture. Uh, a lot of people read scripture for a Bible study or read scripture to learn about the story or read scripture for different reasons, but reading scripture for the sake of prayer is going to be kind of its own mode. And that's what you're doing when you're praying the divine office. You're really reading scripture and the second, you know, reading, patristic reading, whatever, for the sake of prayer, not just for the sake of information. And so fundamentally, that is Lexio Divina. Mm. Okay. Uh, question, as we begin this process, is it typical to miss the voice of God often? How do we know when it is God speaking to us as opposed to being initiated by the participant? Well, it's a, it's a really valuable question in general, about prayer, right? I mean, how do we know it's God speaking as opposed to my own thoughts? And a little like I was saying at the beginning, God humbles himself to be expressed in limited human language. And not just in limited human language, like as if we had access to the fullness of English. You know, he allows himself to be expressed in the limited human language that I can comprehend, my own subset of English, right? So. And not to mention my thoughts and images and, and, and experiences, which are all limited, you know, it's all very limited. So uh, whenever God is, is expressing himself, he's, he's not going to do it in some kind of way that's, that's not accessible to us. He's going to do it in ways that, that are accessible to us. And that's going to sound something like my own thoughts and my own language, because he wants to be understood. He wants to be able to, to be comprehended by us. So uh, so there's always going to be this sort of, you know, is it me? Is it him? Uh, how do we discern that? Well, uh, does it sound like him? Is it, is it coherent with the scriptures, you know, the magisterial interpretation of how he speaks? If it's uh, God saying, you know, go out and slay everybody. <laughs> or if it's God telling us, you know, that we're, that we're hateful and uh, those kinds of things. Well, it's, it's not him. Now, those could be temptations. Those could be things that we struggle with, but, but they're not him, right? So we can, we can hold that up against the church's teaching. But also, I think the, uh, the categories of St. Ignatius can be very helpful here, where he describes spiritual consolation as being a, an inflaming of love in the heart, being lifted up from every creature, being moved to tears, being filled with joy, finding a deep internal peace and stillness, uh, an increase in faith, hope, and love. So these different qualities, uh, different experiences, if, when we find those also accompanying the words that are coming to us, well, those are an encouragement to believe. You know, Ignatius says when we're receiving spiritual consolation, it's God who speaks to us. So, so that's a way also of distinguishing, is it his voice? And at the end of the day, we're never going to prove it. We're always encountering him in a, in a point of that I can say, I believe he spoke to me. You know, I believe he was encouraging me to do this. I believe that he was guiding me to do this. 
we know that there is a kind of built-in fuzz factor uh, that we just discern through faith and, and accept, okay, you know, uh, and, and again, most of the time, what is he saying? He's really telling us that he loves us, that he's with us, he's encouraging us, he's supporting us, he's building us up, he's reinforcing what he's already led us into in our vocations, he's, you know, all of these kinds of things are, are the normal things that he's doing. But, um, so how do I know it's him? And, uh, and then, is it typical to miss the voice of God? So this is, again, um, we don't want to be too binary about these things like got him, didn't get him. It's, it's really better to think of it on, you know, in terms of like fuzzy logic. Uh, it's, it's a more and less thing. So if I took time in prayer, was God speaking to me and did I receive the grace of that? Basically, the answer is yes. Uh, so then how did that manifest itself? Well, maybe I walked away and I discovered, huh, I feel a little bit better than I did when I started. Okay, well, that's God's grace, you know, um, or, or maybe I walk away and I just have a little insight, you know, or, or maybe uh, even as I was praying with you now, I mean, I was really praying and, and was sort of receiving that experience of being loved in my littleness and, and having the courage and uh, feeling the goodness of being little, you know, and that's kind of reinforced in me. So all of that is God's communication to us. Do we miss it at the beginning? I think actually God tends to make it a little easier at the beginning and then it kind of submerges a little bit uh, and then it tends to, to emerge a little bit because we get more used to the way that he speaks and, and, uh, and some of those kinds of things. But uh, I just always encourage, first of all, no, if you took time to pray, it was good prayer, period. And don't get caught up in the more and less, heard God, didn't hear God. He's speaking to you. You received him at some level. Did that come to the level of your mind and thoughts? Well, maybe, maybe not. Um, but stick with it. He wants to have a relationship with us far more than we want to have a relationship with him. Now, I see there's a question written and there's also a hand up. Let me just take the written question uh, quickly and then we'll get to, to Peggy. If I'm interceding for someone in silent prayer and I begin thinking about the person and situation, am I still in prayer or is this a distraction? Well, this is where I would point back to uh, Christian prayer as human, you know, and this idea that like my thoughts are interfering with prayer is kind of getting away from Christian prayer being human. God gave me my thoughts and of course I'm thinking about the person. I'm using all of the natural resources that I have, uh, my, my brain, my reason, my knowledge, my experience, my knowledge of this person, et cetera, using all of that. And I'm also lifting that up to God to let him be more than all of that. God is able to do more than I'm able to bring into my brain. So uh, I want to do both of those things. Now, if I start thinking about whatever, you know, this person is, really irritating. They always wear bad clothes and they kind of smell and I'm really irritated about them and I wish they weren't in my life. And I, you know, I mean, if I, if I start having these kinds of thoughts that start to be more, more critical and we could even say uh, they're not sinful unless I will them, you know, but they're not good thoughts. Now, maybe I, I need to bring that back into my prayer and say, oh Lord, I'm so hard on them. Why am I so hard on this person? Please help them, bless them, you know, really transform them. And, and lift them up, love them in the way they need to be loved. So I might need to push against some of those things. But, um, but ultimately, we, we're trying to bring everyone to God in love, to entrust them to him. And, and uh, yeah, so anyway, it's a few. We're really getting into a lot of interior stuff, which is, which is great. Um, maybe, uh, Peggy, did you have a question? Yeah, I... I really love the point of vulnerability in your first talk, as well as in, in the, um, you know, how does this show God's love to me? So that's what I really need. And that's what this session is on personal prayer. So how do you relate that to more traditional prayer like the rosary? Is it the implication that if we build this up we will have the right attitude as we go into even the mass. I mean, sometimes we just lose attention because it's so familiar and it seems so dry. So 
is the answer to build up this personal prayer so that I have that attitude as I approach more traditional um, structured prayer? Yeah, great question. Thanks for, for bringing that uh, point of vulnerability out, which I do think is so useful. And I, I kind of mentioned it a little bit in passing here, but it's worth uh, reflecting on and also then to connect with the liturgy, with the rosary. That's It's a great point of connection. Yeah, I want to open my heart to the Lord in prayer. And, and the more that I can manifest, it's one of the reasons also these questions about what if I have this thought or that thought or, you know, how do I know what's going on? The, the beautiful thing is like, just open it all up and, and we just extend it to the Lord and say, okay, I don't know. Are these my thoughts? I just want to give you my whole heart. Um, I want to love this person. I want to, um, you know, or, or that, or that word spoken to us, like whoever gives a cup of cold water to one of these little ones. And then I, it gives me courage to feel my littleness, which is very vulnerable. You know, it's like, I'm, kind of not all together and I don't know what to say and I feel awkward and I and I can just open that up to the Lord and and share that with him so it's that vulnerability that really fosters intimacy and in that personal in our personal relationship with him so it, just to reinforce you you mentioned it you were already putting the pieces together but just to let me say it there for a moment and then how do I bring that into the the rosary well again now there are a lot of different layers that are going on uh in a very simple way, I mean, as we, especially as we pray the rosary more and more, we feel like, you know, I'm just holding Mary's hand and there's something that's sweet about the words, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee, blessed art thou among. And, and I don't have to think about them so much, you know, they're almost like flowing through me. And what's flowing through me is very sweet. And I can, I can relate that to a personal presence. You know, it's, it's almost just like saying the name of our mother over and over again. Oh, mama. Oh, mama. Oh, mama. You know, I mean, just really simple. In fact, I, I like the I like the rosary of the Fatima children. Now I know that they were uh, chastised for that, but uh, Hail Mary, Holy Mary. Hail Mary, Holy Mary. Hail Mary, Holy Mary. I just think that's a wonderful rosary. I'm really like, I'm really into that. Um, but just these simple expressions are so sweet. And so there's a way we can really open our heart in that. And then uh, the mysteries of the rosary like the words of scripture are, uh, are really helpful for us. So, um, you know, maybe it's the presentation in the temple. I tend to have these like the same meditations every time, but the presentation in the temple, I want to present what's most precious to me on the altar. And that's very vulnerable, you know? And so I'm saying, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee, blessed art. And I'm just like offering my heart before the Lord on the altar, you know, and just, uh, so that's the, this kind of these simple movements of self-offering, these simple movements of receiving the love that he wants to give me. And likewise, with, uh, with the Mass, uh, you know, I mean, there, there's sort of a simple movement in the Mass of, of giving myself, of receiving him. You know, I'm just sort of doing these things. I'm giving myself over to the ritual. I'm giving myself over to the, you know, what's, what's happening there. It's, uh, it's a little bit like a, you know, if you go to a formal dinner, right, you're kind of going through the stages. We're, oh, we're at the introductory speech stage. You know, we're at the appetizer stage. We're at the, like, have another glass of wine stage. You know, it's like, but I'm, I'm sort of giving myself over to this whole banquet and a participation in it, which unites me with these people. And there's a whole thing that's going on. So there's a very fundamental way that just going through the, the ritual of the liturgy is doing some of that. Now, in addition, I can pray very personally in the context of the liturgy, uh, as I just allow a word, you know, it's, it's like Lexio Divina again. It might be confessing my sins. I mean, I, I was at an ordination this morning and I saw the guys with their, with their purificator after they had their hands anointed. And uh, I was, I, it, it moved me to remember having, that's called a manaturgium. And, and the tradition is that the priest places that in the, he gives it to his mother to be buried with her. And then she shows it to Jesus to say, my son was a priest, you know, so it did all of that to me. I mean, I, I just was right there. I, I put that in the, you know, together with my mother's remains and, and buried that. And, you know, just, I just was moved to this whole uh, 
very personal and, and was just in tears, you know, remembering all of that. So sometimes those things happen in the liturgy, you know, I mean, uh, or, or it's a word that we hear in scripture, it's something in the homily or, or a word from the Eucharistic prayer, you know, I mean, anyway, all that kind of stuff is happening. And as we become just more available to, to receiving that, uh, then we're really giving the Lord permission to draw us into this very personal relationship with him. Um, Thank you. You're welcome. Great, great question. I have another question now from, uh, it says, I tend to be skeptical of spiritual journaling during prayer time because it can make it seem more like a practice in introspection than a fostering of a relationship with the Lord. Yet, sometimes in prayer, I feel an intense impulse to write things down. Where does the desire to keep a spiritual journal come from? Is this an impulse that should be followed? Should it be done during prayer? Should it be resisted or moderated? Great question. Um, you know, I, it's amazing. I just found, oh my gosh, it must be 30, 30 notebooks of, of journals that I did over the course of about six or seven years from uh, my conversion to my first, I don't know, five or six years in the monastery. I read scripture every day and write a reflection about it. <laughs> just amazed that there was so much of it. I really just don't do any of it at all now. Um, but I like to take a little note sometime. I have, a, I have the Verbum app uh, for my phone. So it's got the scripture and you can put a little note on it. And I found that really helpful because I do tend to pray with the daily gospel every day. And, and uh, now over the years, I keep stumbling across my own notes and I keep inspiring myself with my own prayer from the past. It's kind of fun. So uh, there could be a, a, a benefit to, you know, marking a little grace. Sometimes things speak to us in a certain way. Um, you know, so I try, it can be a real distraction for me. I've come to appreciate the just being with the Lord and not trying to, there can be a, like a, a desire to grasp the graces and like keep them somehow. And I think that's probably, that's not a good uh, movement to reinforce, you know, so better, better to just, like St. John of the Cross says, you know, God's communicated the grace. We got it. Don't cling to it. Okay. So I think there's a value to that, but maybe just making a note. Sometimes it's helpful to bring it up in spiritual direction later. Prayer tends to take on a kind of dream state quality that it's like hard to remember what happened in our prayer five minutes later. You know, there's a, there's a certain little bit of a free association that can happen. And sometimes tagging something that went together with a spiritual consolation can be helpful for processing it in spiritual direction, for example. Now, some people I know also really benefit from journaling. They, uh, they, they get, a, you know, it, it just kind of helps keep the mind and it, it helps to externalize it a little bit. I think maybe external processors especially benefit from that. And I, I'd never discourage that I just always would ask, like, just be careful that you're not keeping yourself at a surface level. Sometimes we need to set the pen down so we can settle into a place, go a little bit deeper. Sometimes the, the, the writing can sort of take on a life of its own that we have to be a little bit careful about. So I'd say there's no single answer to that. I think that the points that the uh, person asking the question uh, brought up is is uh, you know as a sign that you're 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 capturing some of the different dimensions of it, and then you have to know yourself. It's probably good to work through it with your spiritual director a little bit, um, to not over journal or or whatever. Good question. Um, another person said, uh, "Let me see." There was a hand that went up first. I see there. Are th Let's see. It's Carol. Um, I'm not sure who had their hand up first, Brenda or Miara. Brenda. Brenda, okay. Well, you, you kind of answered my question in the last question, Father Boniface, because um, I found that it was about journaling because I feel like in the beginning, and I, I did more Lexio and journaling with that in the beginning too. Um, and I feel like I could go back and in some ways it was helpful because I could kind of go back and look at that process of my story with the Lord. But mm -hmm. now I feel more recently, I'm not really picking up my journal. And so I'm wondering, I was wondering if that was a good thing or a bad thing. And, and oftentimes he's doing a lot of healing and I feel like there has been greater intimacy. And it was sort of like you said, I start to lose track of like, well, what even really happened? But, but now I'm sensing from what you're saying, maybe it doesn't really matter. I mean, it's because he's doing the work. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to feel like I can't see you. 
Um, I feel like he's doing the work. So does it really matter if I wrote down what he did? Because I feel like before I was so careful to do that. And now I, I sort of feel like maybe that's not been happening. And I, I think you're saying that's okay. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. yeah, like I said, you know, it's, uh, I, I would kind of keep holding with it open hands. You know, I mean, there may be some times you feel like, yeah, I really need to, I need to capture, I need to write this down. There's, there's something here I need to keep working with or something here I need to share with, this, you know, my spiritual director or whatever. That's fine. But yeah, let go of that kind of need to, to, to hold on to it. No, no. I mean, it's just, again, think of it, think of this in relational terms. You know, mm-hmm. when you have, when you went out on a nice date, uh, you don't, you didn't feel like you had to capture the, the boy, you know, like, you know, keep, keep him somewhere so we can replay that somehow. Oh, it's, it's in us. It's in us fundamentally. Now, sometimes there are, <laughs> There is a way of taking a little note and, you know, there is something sweet to remember anyway. So I think uh, the, you know, maybe that relational analogy is helpful there too. Okay. Thank you. Miara, and then I'll take another uh, written question. I forgot I had to. Oh, you're muted. There we go. I think we must have, someone must have hit the button at the same time. So a um, couple of questions that are somewhat related. Um, I remember reading, I think it was something of St. Teresa of Avila's, um, that as the soul continues to grow in prayer and becomes more and more simple, um, that it should gradually learn to leave behind kind of the, the older ways of praying or the former ways of praying, um, whether that be more meditation or more kind of a, an intellectual prayer for more simple presence, like you were saying earlier. Um, it is very sweet just to sit in that, that presence and just to be with the Lord. Um, and I, I think this is something that happens personally, you know, each person to person kind of dialoguing with the Lord and the Lord has been kind of leading you to that. Um, just like, Lord, what do you want from me? But um, do you have any general um, guidelines for like, for example, if I've committed to praying a liturgy of the hours every day or praying my rosary every day, if the Lord brings me to that place of just kind of being, um, but I didn't finish um, my morning prayer or something like that to, um, that's been a little place of angst in my heart, you know, to what level, um, should I be faithful to that foundation of prayer that I've kind of committed to? Um, and the second question is somewhat related, um, in the balance of prayer and work, which I know is the two part Benedictine, um, charism, um, as the Lord, especially in those times of sweetness, it's great just to spend hours or to spend more and more time. Um, but I was brought to the analogy of a husband and wife that part of the way a husband, shows fidelity to his wife is to go to work every day, to go out and then to come back. Um, So as a person progresses in prayer, um, do you have any suggestions on how to balance maybe a hungry desire to, to be with my spouse, you know, to be in that, but I still have to go to work every day. So to, you know, to know when prayer might be taking over a little bit more of that, that time set aside for fulfilling God's will through work and vice versa. If work is taking up too much time that should be devoted to prayer. Um, Beautiful. Well, I, uh, I'd say uh, one, one, of the, one of the Ignatian principles that I find very helpful is just the, the idea that any of those, you know, you're, you're talking about some kind of fine-grained decision-making in terms of your spiritual plan. And I think Ignatius's simple guidance that if you are going to make those kinds of adjustments, do it in a time of spiritual consolation, not a time of spiritual desolation. Um, so sometimes we can stop short of the liturgy of the hours, or we can make decisions about more prayer or more work or whatever, based on trying to fix spiritual desolation, uh, and and that would be a that would be a bad move. So in a time of spiritual consolation, that's more where I would say with Saint Augustine, love and do what you will. You know, it's like you're in a position of hearing the Lord more clearly there, um, and. <laughs> you know, I sort of understand the, like, uh, maybe I could end up praying too much problem, but I really only understand that in an abstract way. Uh, That seems to be more of an attack that's given by by certain people against people of prayer. I don't know. I I don't think you can really pray too much. Uh, Because if you're actually praying, then the, the one you're praying to is going to direct you to do his will. And so, you know, I think we, we have that sense. Now, again, um, 
so we have to be aware of other things that might be at work in us, like a fear to go out or, uh, you know, maybe some, some other things that are not really holy desires that are, that are more self-centered or something like that. But that's where if we're really praying, God is shining a light on that. And uh, if we're open in those times of consolation and he wants us to go work, he's going to tell us to go work. I mean, if he's telling us to stay, stay with him, then we should stay with him. So uh, again, at that, at that level, I'm uh, listen to the Lord. You know, I don't think there's uh, but, but I say, I, I've given a lot of spiritual direction to a lot of people and I haven't yet found the person that prays too much. So I'm really not anxious about that being the problem. Um, uh, yeah, again, if there is a real running away from work, if there's an avoiding doing things that are difficult and using prayer as an excuse, I think that comes out in a different way than what you were just describing, you know? So unless you're a, a more developed rationalizer than some of the rest of us. <laughs> but anyway, I don't think so. <laughs> Thank you, Father. Yeah, yeah, good questions. Um, Let's see. So I had, had a question that was already answered by someone else. Verbum is a whole scripture thing. It's like a lot. It, that's uh, anyway, it's just one of the features happens to be this note taking piece. Um, one more question here. I used to think praying with my entire heart and mind entirely focused and engaged on the words was necessary. I'm realizing that even in deciding to pray this particular prayer, even when my mind may be distracted from words at times, since it is my will to pray these words, therefore my intention is present, so it is still valid prayer. Yeah, yeah, again, it's like, make the relational analogy. You know, it's, you, you make a decision to be with somebody, we're gonna go have dinner together. Now, am I thinking about you the entire time we're having dinner together? I, I'm pretty good at keeping attention, but I'm not that good. I mean, I'm thinking about some other stuff. I'm, I'm thinking about what's happening afterward. I'm getting a phone call in the middle, you know, I'm, there's stuff going on. But did we have dinner together? Absolutely, we had dinner together. There's no question about that, right? So there's something very fundamental about making the decision to pray, being with, you know, being with the Lord in prayer. Now, obviously, I want to keep turning my attention to him, but but we're human beings, we're not angels. We, there's, we don't, it's not even, we're, it's not physically, it's not possible for us by our own willpower to fix our attention on the Lord so firmly that that's all we think about for a minute, let alone you know a half an hour, an hour or something else. So we can't do that by our own willpower. Now there are times that God gives us a particular grace. Uh, it's really, it's really a, almost an extraordinary phenomenon to have a, such a fixed attention to, uh, on him but even that divine touch, as Teresa of Avila describes it, she says like, you know, a half an hour is the longest she ever experienced. And that was like once in her lifetime. <laughs> you know, prayer is, is much more bursty in its kind of fixed attention. It's, it's much more, you know, making a decision to be with him, opening our lives to him, directing ourselves in a general way towards him, and then redirecting ourselves, making that that decision. So just, I'm just reiterating what the question was, just uh, very, very well expressed. Yeah, it's not this kind of lock grip onto something. It's, you know, it's, it's really much more relational, natural, supernatural, human, uh, bringing our humanity before the Lord. Um, how long do you think we should set aside time each day for personal prayer? <laughs> My spiritual director tells everybody, strive to make a holy hour. So I generally say the same thing. Now, I, I tend to, to, well, he also works with people wherever they are, you know. Um, but I think, it, I think it's a good thing to strive for. I, I, I find that it's the rare person who's married with children who can make a holy hour. But... I'd say just about everybody else can do it. Um, and a married person with children, I'd say even at least 15 minutes of dedicated personal prayer is, is really good. Uh, I wouldn't rule out a holy hour by any means, but, but uh, 
you know, aim for an hour, it takes a little bit of time to get up to that place. Um, but then, yeah, I, I think it's, uh, I think it's really very manageable. And, and for the most part, you know, that it's really a time of, of silence, of presence, of mental prayer, of speaking from the heart, of being open to him. Um, I wouldn't fill it with a lot of doing stuff. It's not like I'm going to crank out my seven versions of the St. Bridget prayer, you know, 16 sets of uh, the St. Joseph chaplet, the, uh, you know, five divine mercy chaplets and three rosaries, and that'll pretty much fill up my time. <laughs> I mean, uh, we want to be careful about it, not just being too much activism, but really a healthy amount of time to receive as well as any of those beautiful prayers. I'm not speaking, I'm not talking down about them by any means. But, um, you know, that it not just be rattling through things like spiritual athletics, but that it's really relational with, with some give and take 